if you are new and you want to set up a pulse chain validator on mainnet. This is the repo. I'll post it in the chat one more time. So this is where the guide, this is where all the content is, this is where all the scripts are. Automated most of the process of setting up a validator. So in this repo, validator setup. So you just you just have a script and you run the script and it sets up almost the entire process. I got guidance on using the staking deposit client, setting up monitoring. If you want to use the cloud or use home, I have documentation on that, how to update your client, how to change the fee recipient or IP address if it changes, how to use your validator, your node validator as, you know, run your own node. If you're running your own node, you can use it for your local RPC to do transactions and stuff and how to do withdrawals and how to snapshot and move around stuff if you're using it at home, as well as snapshot information of how to use it in the cloud if you're using that for hosting. So uh, before I did the video on testnet, this is, uh, you know, the instructions have been updated a little bit for mainnet, but it's mostly the same, just a few things that make it a little bit easier. And the first thing you want to do is run the script. So we'll do a quick walk through the script and see how that works. Uh, but first, uh, you need hardware. So let's just start there real quick. I'm not going to talk much about hardware, but essentially, uh, there's validatorstore.com. And that is a community-run site by David Feeder. And he is uh, supplying some validator kits uh, with some pretty good specs. These are above the minimum, uh, in my opinion. So uh, very good for not having problems and all that stuff. And we'll talk about minimum specs in a minute as well. But validatorstore.com, if you want to run it at home, um, of course, you know, you can look at the minimum specs and use your own computer or server and stuff as well. But make sure you do meet the minimum specs we'll talk about in a minute. If you want to use the cloud, I have instructions on using AWS so you can run validators in the cloud if that's your thing. There's pros and cons both ways uh, that I've discussed at length on the different uh, security nuances and stuff as well. And uh, yeah, like I said, there's benefits both ways, but you can use the cloud or run a validator at home. So we'll look at the minimum requirements real quick. And there's a table of contents on the wiki that allow you to go through this. So you click on hardware. So the minimum requirements, uh, 32 gigs of RAM, two terabytes disk, and plenty of processing power. That could be a quad core, Xeon, Ryzen, 4 to 8 vCPUs uh, if you're using AWS. And on AWS, that would the specs that would match that is a M2 2x large server. If you're choosing an instance to spin up a server, to spin up instance is just AWS way of saying it. And if you're running at home, maybe you want to get a battery backup. If you're running in the cloud, no need. You know, they, they take care of uptime, bandwidth, all that stuff. So it's recommended that you have new hardware if you're running at home. If you have some laptop in the corner that you want to use the validator, I wouldn't personally do it. I don't want the thing to die at some point because the hard disk is too old or whatever, uh, and then have to replace everything. That's very randomizing. So I would, I myself would choose, if I'm running it from home, I would get that new hardware that meets or exceeds these. Uh, minimum requirements. And again, these definitely exceed the minimum requirements that are a, kind of a consensus around the community. It could be, can you use it with less? Sure. But do you want to be randomized when it fails? I don't. So I wouldn't do that. And then uh, the environment. So a lot of this is built for Ubuntu 2204. It may work on other versions, but they're not supported. If there's any, uh, if there's any issues, you know, I'm working off of this. So I update the script to make sure that it works on this. And these are the scripts that I'm using. And there's a bunch of walkthroughs. Uh, I'll add this video to this list as well. But essentially, once you clone the repo, so once you have the hardware set up, you have Ubuntu installed. Uh, let's go to Ubuntu real quick. Let me just type in Ubuntu Linux ISO. That is the disk image. And there's plenty of guys to show you how to get Ubuntu uh, downloaded and create a USB key to boot off of or, or, or a DVD or whatever it is. So this is the version that's been tested on and you want to download that and put it on your server in some way. If you're doing it at home, if you're doing it in the cloud, then you can just choose that from the drop down box. Uh, again, I've got instructions for how to do a cloud on here. So I do have this cloud set up and this is a doc that walks through the process if you're interested in doing that. Tells you how to register, tells you 
um, you know, how to set it up and the different stuff to choose and how to use key pairs and firewalls and all that stuff. So that is available as well. And I'll drop that in the chat. So, so once you have your hardware and you have your operating system set up, then you are uh, going, you can run this script. So let me go through the script and how it works. Essentially there's a node user and that is what is added to the machine. And that is what runs the services that make the validator go burr. So, second. So the node user does that. And then these are the app packages that are required in order to uh, set everything up. And then we use the pulse chain as the chain flags. These are the directories where data and other stuff is stored for geth. This is the DWD secret directory where we'll be generating the keys so the clients can talk to each other. This is the directory that Lighthouse uses uh, and various stuff about that. And the repos that we'll be pulling the code from for uh, pulse chain mainnet and just a couple other options for the Lighthouse client as well. So Geth is our execution client. That is what's supported. There are other execution clients uh, and other consensus clients. However, the, the script uses Geth and Lighthouse as the consensus client. And then there's only two uh, parameters that are required. Parameters, aka arguments. Um, and that is, I'll show you here. So command line options. This is what you would do at your terminal, dot slash pulse chain validator setup. And then this is your network fee address. So your fee address is where suggested uh, fees go. Uh, these are the fees that, uh, the priority fees that come from users who want to, uh, who want to incentivize you to do their transactions, to process them and stuff. So only two parameters. The first one is your fee address. And this is again an Ethereum address that you own, that you want to uh, you want the network to send fees to, uh, that your your share of the fees at least, and then your IP address, your server IP address. Now these may change, so that, you know IP address more likely than this. This was you know if you want to change, you can. I have a script to do that in the repo. This may change from time to time. If you don't have a static external IP address, this could change. So if it does, there's a script to update that. I'll uh, I'll mention that uh, in a few minutes as well. So once you, um, that's how you run it. And I'll just quickly go through step one, it installs requirements. Step two, it adds a node user. This is what's running your clients. Uh, then it also generates the secret, stores that. Step three, it sets up geth, does a bunch of stuff here to make that work correctly. Builds everything, pulls it down, builds everything. And then it gets geth into a system service that we can easily control. And we'll talk more about that in a moment as well. And then step four sets up Lighthouse. So similar thing as Geth, but it is uh, setting up our consensus client, Lighthouse. Does a few tricks here. Lighthouse has uh, two processes. It has the beacon service and it has the validator client. So it sets up both of those services. And then step five, setting up your firewall. Uh, if you're on AWS, you'll need to also set up security groups, aka firewall, to uh, allow these ports as well. And if you are running at home, you may need to forward these on a router as well to expose them to the internet, not just on the local computer, but also whatever network your device, whatever gateway you're using to access the internet, router, whatever it may be, you need to forward those as well if you want them, you know, forward them to your server only. And then afterwards, it just tells you uh, the next steps, which we'll go through in the wiki. And at this point, you should not make your deposit. If you make your deposit after running the script, then you're not ready to work. So again, think about your, when you make your deposit, that is saying my validator is ready to go and I want to start participating in the network. If you make your deposit and you're activated before you are synced, the blockchain is synced, which could take a couple of days, then you may get some penalties, you may get slashed otherwise. So just think of it as 
this is setting up, this is getting ready for work. This is getting ready for you to uh, be a validator. And then after that, the next step is, uh, so if you go here and it says, after running the script. So after running the script, again, this does almost everything, sets up your environment, installs the clients, does pretty much all the things it can automate. After that, you need to generate your keys. So you can either use a live CD or a bootable USB. And Rufus is the program that a lot of people use if you're running Windows. You can download uh, an ISO. So like you download the Ubuntu ISO and then you put it on the USB drive and then you can boot that uh, to, um, to generate your keys. Because the idea is you wanna keep your, your keys and your C words and stuff away from your server. And you want to spin up either a new machine, uh, like I said here, or a, or just use a machine you have. It could be your server, as long as you don't install Ubuntu, but you just run a, want to run a live environment, for example, using a bootable USB. It could be, if you're installing it at home and you use the bootable USB to install Ubuntu and run your server, you can use that same USB key to reboot the server and, um, generate your keys using the live environment. So that's one way to do it. You just want a temporary option because when you, after you generate keys from there and you, you, uh, you know, write them down and keep them all secure and transfer them off of that with USB key, for example, in that case, then it goes away. And, uh, that's what you want. You want something where you just generate them. It's secure. You take your keys, put them in the USB key. You take your seed word, you make sure you, you capture all that stuff. And then you can reboot back into your server OS or just use another machine to do it. Uh, so if you don't want to touch your server, so that's fine. So either that, use another machine. So if you got a spare laptop or whatever, uh, you can boot off of there as well. Uh, try not to connect to the internet, only to download the client. Whatever you need to do, you can use a virtual machine. You can spin up, you know, not, I probably wouldn't do this for mainnet, but if you, you know, it's another way to do it is to spin up a temporary free tier cloud instance or something and do it. But these two are the less secure options. These two are the most secure options. So uh, try to do these two if possible. And then once you generate the keys, so you just follow these instructions. So on the different machine, once you have the live OS or the other machine or whatever it is, that is not your server, you follow these instructions, use the commands that will do it. And then you run the deposit script. So dot slash deposit dot sh, pneumonomic, the chain is pulse chain. Very important here. Make sure that you have another address that you control in one way or another that is very secure that you use, you put the address here. So if you mess this up, you cannot get your withdrawal. You can, when you, once you exit the network, you cannot get your deposit back. It's 32 million per, per PLS. So if you don't want to lose your funds, make sure you control this, only you control this, and you don't typo it. Be very careful. There's only certain parts of the process where you need to be extremely careful, and this is one of them. So make sure you enter the correct address that you own the keys to. So one day, if you're done validating, you can get your 32 million per validator back. So once you run the script, it'll ask you a bunch of questions. It'll say, you know, English, like what language you want to use. And then it'll ask you how many validators you want to run. Now, when you run the script, the, the, the script you just ran has nothing to do with how many validators it can run. It, it doesn't pick your validators. You pick your validators when you generate your keys. So when you run this script, it's going to ask you how many validators you want to run. You can run one, you can run five, 10, 15, a hundred, a thousand, whatever. If you run, not a lot of people tested this or talked about it or anything, but if you run more than 50, for example, you may want to have a, uh, you may want to up your hardware requirements. So instead of 32 gigs of RAM, maybe you want to do 64, uh, stuff like that. Maybe instead of a, uh, a quad core, the, you know, at, at two gigahertz or something, you want to do three gigahertz and you know, you know what I'm saying? Just double your hardware requirements. If you're running that much, if you have that much pulse to do, you can probably afford it anyways. Right. So if you're doing 50 to hundred, I would say double the minimum hardware requirements. I think that this would be probably okay. If you're running that much, I don't know if David has talked about, uh, his recommendation on that he may have in a video, 
But if you're running more than that, this, maybe this works. Um, again, it's, it's hard to speak on it when uh, and not a lot of people would speak on it, right? Because then people know how much you have and all this stuff. So just be careful if you're running that many. Most people don't have to worry about it. If you're running more, less than 50, then the minimum or uh, a little bit more. So just this should be should work fine. Again, the network's been out not very long. We've had a test net, but uh, it's hard to come up with this official information. A lot of it is just based on experience and, and what we want to share. So once you generate your keys, you need to get them. So step one, after you run the script, there's three things you need to do. Step one is spin up another machine, that's a secure machine somehow, using these options, and generate your keys. Okay, so spin up the machine, generate your keys. Once you've done that, you need to copy your keys over to your validator server somehow. So for example, there's a few different ways I've listed here how to do it. You can use a SCP to copy them over the network. You can use this base 64 trick on how to do it. You can use USB. So a lot of people probably just use USB method where you just plug a USB stick into the machine where you generate them, copy things over. Don't copy your seed words or anything. Those are offline. Those are something you write down and, and take care of and all that. But you need to take, it's going to generate a folder called validator under slash keys. And you want to copy that folder onto the USB key if you're doing it at home. And then take the USB key, put it in the server, and then copy them over from there. Once you copy them over, so again, that's step two. Step one is generate them. Step two is copy them over. Step three is import them. So once you copy them over, these are the commands. Assuming your validator keys um, are, are in here. So if they're not, so wherever your validator keys are, you want to put them in the node home directory. So run these commands as if you were in the directory where validator keys directory is. You need to be in that directory because this copy command is saying, copy the directory validator keys to home node. Make sure you're in the directory with validator keys or else it will not work. You'd be very confused. But that's how this works. This is a copy command. It's gotta have this available to copy it. So wherever you copy them, make sure you're in that directory. CD, change directory into that directory, copy them over. So once you have them there, it's just changing permissions and then run a shell as a node user. Once you're as a node user, you can import them. So again, step one is generate your keys. Step two is copy the keys on your server. Only your keys, right? That, that folder, this is your keys. These are your keys. There's, there's a bunch of JSON files. How many validators you, you generated? There's a JSON file for each one and there's deposit JSON file, which has a list of those, which you'll be uh, uploading later. So once you, step three is to import them into Lighthouse. This is the command to do that. So you're importing your validator keys that you copied to your home directory. This is home, home validator keys, copying them in there. And then follow the rest of the instructions, you know, the password, copy them in, and then go back to, the, to your, your other user. If you're at home, you may be whatever user. If you're on AWS, it's about to. I guess technically there's four steps. So generate your keys, copy them over, import them. And once you import them, then you can start your validator service and all that. And then you can make your deposit. So step four is make your deposit. So you go to launchpad.pulsechain.com and you click become a validator. Current API is 28%, it's awesome. Wow, we really, we've added almost 10K validators since the Genesis. So it's 4,096 out of 10K. That is impressive. You click become a validator. You go through all this. You know, I'll actually read all this stuff. I've already read it, you know, 50 times. So I'm not going to read it all, but read all this stuff. Make sure you understand it. A lot of it we went through in the guide, but this is a great checklist. So once you go through it all, you know, uh, you select your client. It's not really necessary, but, you know, go pulse kind of because whatever you select, it just kind of gives you information about it. But, you know, we've already set up all this stuff. And then we select the lighthouse and it tells you about the lighthouse and different documentation here. And then however many validators that you may generate deposit keys for. 
type that in. So if it's if it's 100, then you need to make a 3.2 billion PLS deposit. If it's one, you make a 32 million PLS deposit. You know, if, it's, if it's 10, 3 and 20, you get the idea. So once you do that, now you provide your withdrawal address here. And that is something you just generated. So if we go back here, remember, when we're generating the generating the keys, we did withdrawal, withdrawal address. You take that same thing and you put it in here. So whatever it is, 0x, all that stuff. After you do that, you know, this, this is just telling you uh, like, you know, the commands, you know, we already generated keys and stuff like that. So once you do that, now you're ready to make a deposit. So you need to get your deposit. You, know, you don't need the rest of your keys, but you need your deposit file. So if you're doing this on another computer, just take that USB key and put it in the computer. You know, hopefully your, your computer's safe enough to do this on. Put it on that computer or somehow copy copy the deposit JSON file over. And then you're going to upload that. You're going to drag it here, upload it. Once you do that, you know, I don't have one here, but once you do that, you hit continue. Then you'll make your deposit for each one. It'll say, okay, make a deposit for each validator. You make a deposit. And then from there, uh, you're good. So after you make that, after you make your deposits, it takes about, so it takes about two days to be synced. So again, do not make your deposit until your validator is synced. Do not make your deposit until your validator is synced. If you're not ready to work, don't sign up to do work. Okay. It takes about two days for your validator to sync, just estimated. And then it takes about 16 to 24 hours for the activation of your validator. So it's around three days, expect around three to four days, give a little bit of buffer, three or four days for the entire process for a validator to come online from start to finish. Once it's online, in your deposit JSON file, you can see your public keys that you've generated for your validator. So I went to this one. So for example, you know, this is, this is a public key for validator and you'll get a number uh, for each validator you have, and then you're able to look it up. So once you make your deposit, you'll see it's impending. It'll be like maybe pulsing green or something. So deposited pending. And it, it means, you know, you're, you're waiting to be activated. Once it's activated, Glorious, glorious activation. Then you'll become active. And then that's when you'll see all these other stats. You'll see all the validator history. This is, uh, you know, this is just a withdrawal going to. So if you, if you gave a withdrawal address, you generated and stuff, right? This is kind of aggregating a lot of the rewards and stuff and then putting them automatically uh, sending to your withdrawal address uh, because you only, you know, it's excess PLS basically. You only need around 32 million. Once it gets more than that, then uh, it'll start doing automatic withdrawals. That's, that's how the Ethereum 2.0 stuff works. So at that point, you're good, right? You've, uh, you did the three or four steps. You got everything going. Now, if you want to check the progress of syncing and stuff, you can check the progress here with Geth. You can run this command and then you can see at current, your current block, which means where you're currently synced to, where you are, and this is where you're going. This is your highest block on the network. That's where you want to be. So when these two meet, and uh, you, you may see that uh, you already synced already. It's another command you can look at too. And then you can look at health health stats and stuff with Lighthouse and also check and see if Lighthouse synced. So Lighthouse should sync much quicker than Geth. Geth is going to take a while. Lighthouse uh, should be much faster. But both of them combined around two days and then around one day to be activated. And if you want to look at the client status and stuff, uh, you can use this, system control, do status. If you want to look at the debug logs, if you get an error or something, you feel like something's going wrong, these are different ways to do that. And if everything keeps going wrong, you don't know what's going on, you just want to start over, there's a reset script. You can run the reset script, which will delete um, validator data. It'll keep, by default, it keeps the blockchain data, so you don't have to resync all of it again. Uh, that was a recommendation uh, they ended up getting implemented as well. And that is this script. So let's see, reset validator. So this is something that, you know, change this to true if you want to use it. Just make sure you don't run it on accident. And it will reset everything to as much as possible as if you didn't run the validator again, or at least it's, it resets enough to get, you know, to not run into issues when you're running the script again. And then you can run the, the uh, in installation script again. 
So after that, there's also the, there's other scripts. So if you want to run it, set up monitoring, you can run this script, run the monitoring script, and it will install Grafana and Prometheus, and it will update your services to do this. So this is specific to my set of scripts. So if you set up your server somewhere else with Docker or otherwise, this is not going to work. This only works if you use my setup script. And then if you, uh, again, run this, this script that also created, it just, it modifies, it relies on, has different dependencies relying on uh, different places of where to add the metrics flags and stuff like that. So after you run that script, let's see, let's go to the, let's go to the monitoring section. So after you run the script, it sets everything up. You just need to do the install. And this tells you how to do it, tells you how to access it locally, more secure way. And these are all the instructions for that. And once you have it set up, you can get these pretty dashboards and see all kinds of cool stats about your validator. There's other scripts as well. Um, every six months, the only thing you really need to do for maintenance is maybe every three to six months or so, you need to uh, prune Geth. So Geth doesn't do it automatically. Aragon automatically prunes blockchain data, but essentially you can set up a cron job, you know, Google for that. It's, it's not that hard. Or just remind yourself, set a calendar invite for every you know, every quarter, every six months to uh, run the script and do the pruning uh, to make sure, because otherwise it's going to fill the disk up with a lot of blockchain data and uh, it may uh, yeah, cause your validator to run out of disk space. You don't want that to happen. So there, that's the only real maintenance I can think of for a validator is every quarter, every six months, you, you know, maybe need to run a, a pruning script. But besides that, it's, uh, it's pretty hands-off once you get everything set up. But, you, you know, you still want to check it every once in a while. You don't want to be you know, it'll show you in red here pulsing if there's some, for some reason you keep getting penalized or slashed or whatever. So there's, you know, you can check this for uh, every once in a while to make sure like something is actually not, not wrong with your server. So you can set that up. Again, I have a ton of docs. That's why I, I created a table of contents because there's so much content here. Uh, every once in a while you may want, need to update your clients. That's the only other maintenance too. So if, there's a big parameter change on the network or something big happens. You'll, you know, you want to pay attention to what Richard tweets. If you tweet something like that or the devs or otherwise, and there is a client update script in case of uh, you know, a big network update that it's going to cause your client to stop participating correctly. Uh, there's a script to help you figure that out. If you want to update your IP address, if it changes or something, uh, there's a script to do that. All of them are pretty self-explanatory as far as that goes. And then that is the meat of it. After that, um, again, there's some networking stuff, security stuff uh, that you may want to take a look at. Um, there's, there's, you know, the way it's set up, the script kind of does some security things too to make it better. Um, at home, I would not plug this into my home Wi-Fi network uh, that connects to all my other computers. If you're going to do it at home, I would uh, suggest you do something like cascading routers, like a, L, a VLAN. Basically, you can plug in another router to physically separate the network. And the, your router is the only thing on that network. And it's away from all your other computers. Because if someone compromises your validator, hopefully that never happens to anyone. But if they do, you don't want them to have access to your home computer, your banking, all that stuff. So you need some kind of separation. If you do this in the cloud, that's one advantage. Cloud is completely separate from your own computer. So you don't really have to do anything uh, extra for that. So you can, yeah, you can learn more security. I did some different uh, talks on that, uh, different guides and stuff out there. Uh, Gamma's got some stuff. Uh, TDS Lane, AKA Dip Slayer uh, has scripts as well. Different people doing awesome stuff. David Feeder has a uh, guide slash script as well. A ton of references. Uh, the FAQ covers some questions. So what kind of specs, what kind of, uh, how long does can you run more than one validator? How can you see stats? All that stuff. So feel free to go through that if you need help. And uh, again, I, I'm not, I don't do, uh, I'm, I'm not really around for help that much. I try to help people when I can, but no expectations. Uh, the best place to hear people discussing questions and ask your own that you may get help on is t.me forward slash pulse dev. And there's also a game of DevOps chat as well, where a lot of validator uh, stuff is going on. So I think that is about it. Uh, withdrawals, you know, you can go through that section as well uh, at some point, but you probably won't need it anytime soon unless you really want to exit the network. 
and the different scripts here that just help you uh, be awesome as a validator. So there's backups information. You can, you can read about that in the backup section. Um, there's uh, just a ton of different details and walkthroughs and nuance and, and all that as well. So feel free to check that out. Again, I'll drop it in the chat. And that is the official repo. So good luck validating.